In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. Yesterday on Lazarus Saturday, um, <laughs> I can't see you. Uh, yesterday on Lazarus Saturday, I, I discussed briefly um, the themes of that day, which, which are to say that um, Jesus, of course, raises Lazarus, who is four days dead, and by doing so proves that he has the power over death. And also, we can say that this coming week, when he dies and rises on the third day, as we are going to celebrate it during Holy Week and his Holy Passion, that he will die and rise and conquer, in doing so, conquer death, show that he has conquered death. And the palms we hold in our hands are symbols of that victory. Now, when a ruler would come, or when a military leader would come, after winning a great battle, after celebrating a victory, they would often triumphantly process into the town, uh, usually on, uh, sometimes on their soldier shields. Sometimes this would be mounted on uh, whatever they were mounting back then, certainly not a donkey. And they would be greeted as a victorious ruler. And of course, this is the image that the, the Gospels portray of Jesus, that he's greeted as a, a victorious ruler. And again, the victory is a victory over death, which we uh, commemorate. But there's more to the story that we hear today. There's a lot more going on than just simply this uh, victorious, uh, victorious celebration. The joyful side is that Jesus is victorious. He does conquer death. He does raise Lazarus. The other side of the equation, though, is that in raising Lazarus, he creates a great divide between people. There are those who are praising him, and there are those who we even hear in today's gospel are already plotting to kill Lazarus because many followed after Jesus. And there are those we'll hear who are plotting to kill Jesus. Now, why would they be plotting to kill someone who essentially has cured something that every generation has looked for a cure for, that being death? Nobody wants to die. The fountain of immortality has been sought out. Well, the truth is, is because ultimately they want to kill Jesus and kill Lazarus because in acknowledging Christ's power, in acknowledging his victory over death, it at the same time overthrows their order. You see, the religious authorities of the time do not like that people are following Jesus. Now, if Jesus was one of them, and he had said and given his power to them, if he had given his seal of approval on the scribes and Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the, the priests and all those rulers of the time, then they probably wouldn't want to kill him. They would want him to be a part of them so that they could brag that one of their own was a prophet and was doing all these signs. But because he's exposing their darkness... But because he's actually confronted them, and we'll hear on Monday and Tuesday, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, a long litany, because he has challenged them down to the very core, even saying that Moses and Abraham could be raised up from the stones and would witness against that generation, this is the reason they want and plot to kill him. You know, in our spiritual lives, we can also uh, contemplate today, in a sense. Before I go there, let me say that another reason they wanted to kill him is because there's a disappointment going on here. Eventually, Christ will be crucified this Friday because, partially because of disappointment. All the fathers say that, and the scriptures even say that they expected the people expected some sort of ruler to come and to take them out of the nation of Rome to separate, to deliver. The Messiah was supposed to be 
a political Messiah. And so with great joy and hope that if he can conquer death, he can also conquer the Romans. And he can lead his people to a secular victory, then somehow, that somehow he is the true Messiah. And of course, all these people are sorely disappointed later. Because his kingdom is not of this world. And so if we were to mix these two themes, the theme of disappointment, along with the theme of the turning over of the world, the turning over of authority, we can begin to think about our own spiritual lives. We stand here commemoratively holding palms about Jesus' victory. But that victory isn't an abstract victory that took place 2,000 years ago. It's a victory that we're meant to partake of. And so many of us in our Christian lives, and I mentioned this yesterday, have asked the question, what is the difference between how it was before Jesus came, died, and rose again? And now, what's the difference after the resurrection? People are still dying. People are still rotting in the grave. People are still miserable. Christians are often fairly miserable. And so, disappointment. I've heard many disappointed Christians. Christians who thought that the Christian walk was about something that it might not necessarily have been about. People who had invested their faith, we can think very as a as kind of an iconic picture, the prosperity gospel that teaches wealth, riches, success, and all these things associated with simply following Jesus. <clears throat> How disappointing it is that all the apostles were beheaded or, or killed who followed Jesus. How disappointing it is that the faith really isn't about me feeling good about myself and being wealthy and rich and being well-adjusted. Too bad. It's a different faith. And so that disappointment is often embittering and turns us sour and turns us in some ways against Christ. And this is many of our spiritual struggles that we have. We often also have to say that Christ is not only dethroned the religious rulers from their thrones of power, but he also calls and dethrones us from power in our own lives, or at least the power we think we have. We go from being slaves to sin to being slaves to Christ. Never in the gospel is it said that, we're, we're own, we're, that we are our own people, that somehow we own ourselves and are allowed to dictate what we believe, what we think, and what we're going to do, and how we're going to live our life. The Christian life is one of submission to the will of God, to Christ. And so this is also partially a disappointment, and partially why, in many ways, we don't experience the victory. Because Christ's victory is not of this world, and it's asking us to step off our thrones, to set aside our egotistical selves, to set aside our sinful selves, and to pursue the kingdom of heaven at all costs. And many of us don't want to do this, myself included at times, do not want to do this. And so, I would also be one who might crucify Christ. I might crucify him out of disappointment, I might crucify him because he wants to take away the control of my life that I really want. The control to be a spiritual guru or to be a great preacher, to be whatever it is. And the truth is I have no control over that because I'm a servant of Christ and I'm supposed to submit to him and allow him to give me grace. So as we hold these palms of victory, let us contemplate our own disappointment with God, with the gospel. We are disappointed because we have the wrong expectations, because our faith is wrong, because we believe false things. 
The only way to true victory and joy is by actually coming in contact to the authentic gospel. In the gospel that we'll witness this week, which is a following of Christ to the cross, which is a dethroning of our ego, a dethroning of our power structure within our hearts and within our souls, so that we may die with him and rise with him. And if we die and rise with him, and if you have died and rise with him, or experienced it empirically, not only in the symbol of baptism, or in the reality of baptism, but also in the daily repentant deaths that we're called to experience, if we experience any bit of that resurrection, then we understand what victory is. And that is the joy that we're called to celebrate this feast. I think the assumption of many of these feasts is not that we put on a joyful smile and act happy and, you know, today's a special day and dress up specially and everything, but that deeply in our souls, because of our experience of the death and resurrection, because of our own experience of partaking of the victory of Christ, that somehow this victory would ring like a bell, that it would jump out at us, that it would be a commemoration not of a a resurrection of Lazarus or a resurrection of Jesus, but of the experience of our own resurrection. And that is the joy we're called to have in today's feast. May God bless us if we haven't had those experiences to somehow encounter them, to have them so that we can have that authentic joy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ is in our midst. Yes. <clears throat>